All right, ATM Hotep. Welcome to Seshu Ma'ani Meru Nature. Today is Divine Words Wednesday. And Rini, my name is Wujau Mineb Eri Ma'at. And I'll be running a point guard for tonight's session. And uh, tonight, our Divine Words Wednesdays is where we slow things up. Uh, a little different from Freestyle Fridays. Our Divine Words Wednesdays is where we uh, spend a little bit more time in explaining uh, methodology and we're actually able to go into a little bit more details than we would normally do on Freestyle Fridays. So tonight we are going to showcase the translation method um, that we refer to as Tep Hesip, uh, the Tep Hesip translation method. And the word or phrase Tep Hesip means correct method. And so uh, this is a method that we uh, perform at all times, even on Freestyle Friday. But this time we will be able to slow things down and explain it and actually walk through the different steps in more detail than how we do on the Fridays. So we're going to use a Stella that has about 15 lines in it. And we're not going to have time to go through all 15 lines. So we're going to start at the beginning and just walk our way through for a uh, suitable amount of time to keep the video, uh, you know, a nice size video to um, hopefully everyone could benefit from. And then maybe in future shows, we'll pick up where we left off and continue forward. But for now, we'll do as many lines as we have time for, and we'll showcase all four of the steps to the Tep Hesib translation method. All right. So again, uh, appreciate anyone's tuned in. Uh, if you are tuned in now, make sure you subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Uh, and also make sure you click on the bell that you see at the bottom right below the video to make sure that you're notified when we're online. And also uh, share the video. Share the video on Facebook or wherever you think that people may be interested and may be able to benefit for, from what we have to share for tonight. All right. Uh, so. I'm going to uh, open the mic up. Uh, we have other panel members of the Seshu Mani Meta Nature um, with us tonight. And so I will uh, open the mic up and everybody can introduce themselves and then we'll uh, get right to it. ETM Hotel. Welcome in peace, everybody. It's your brother, June. Just want to say thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoy the show and leave with satisfaction. Hotep. Hotep. <laughs> Hotep. Ren uh, I Imiket. My name is Imiket, and uh, I hope you enjoy our Divine Words Wednesday. All right. ETM Hotep. Rene Sean, welcome in peace. My name is Sean. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in today for tonight's show. All righty. And I'll... Hotel. Okay. Randy, Damo, uh, thank you all for tuning in. All right, all right, all right. So um, other panel members may be joining us uh, shortly. And um, that was very good. Uh, and, and to you, uh, Damo, we heard you loud and clear. All right. So um, we are going to keep our eye out on the chat just to kind of get some uh, feedback and make sure we did, we address everyone's uh, question. And so far, even before we begin, we have one question. Uh, Julanda uh, asked Tep Hesip. She puts a question. Tep Hesip? Like, what is Tep Hesip? <laughs> so uh, very quickly, uh, Tep Hesip is two words. And you actually, she actually um, transliterated. Oh, uh, Sonnet Imiket uh, put the transliteration in there. Uh, it's two words. The word tep is a word for head or tip. And that's easy to remember because tep, the consonant is T and P. And just think of it as tip or the top, the tip or the top. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a word that means the best, like the best portion of something, the portion that's important, you know, um, so the word tep is is best 
uh, top and things like that. And it's also the glyph of a head in profile, profile view. And then the word hesub actually means to calculate or to reckon, which means to count, to count something, to calculate something. And so tep hesub as a phrase literally would be the best calculation. And it became a phrase, you know, in the language to be known as the best, best method of doing things. You know, um, because when you're making a judgment and you're analyzing things, you're based, you're, you're calculating something and you're, and you're analyzing it, making sure things are logical, they add up and so on and so forth. So it became an idiom for the best method or correct method. And the actual word can be found, uh, in the Ahmos or Ahmes papyrus that is a misnomer, the mathematical uh, papyri, Rhine's mathematical papyri, where you see that word is used, and uh, that's where a lot of people know it from. So we refer to Tep Hesip, uh, the translation method, or Tep Hesip translation method, uh, as the best or correct method in order to translate. So that's what we're going to be going over tonight. All right, so we want to, um, I'm going to jump in. As a matter of fact, let me make sure that um, I told. I made sure I got to fulfill um, my word. Um, I need to make sure I tag um, the students from uh, Uganda and Tanzania in the video. So pardon me while I quickly do that. If anyone on the panel has um, anything they want to kind of share right before we jump in, I just want to make sure that everyone's tagged in the video. Give everyone opportunity. No. <laughs> all right. So I got to do all the talking. All right. So while I'm tagging, tagging everyone, um, remember our Freestyle Fridays, we... Um, we actually go through the four steps of the transliteration um, method, but except we don't use any books. So we refer to it freestyle. That's why we refer to it as a freestyle. We don't use any books and we try to use our just everything from our memory. But here tonight, we're going to slow it up and we're going to actually go through the process in more detail. And like I said, we have a 15 row or 15 uh, line Stella to do. But we won't have time to go through all 15. And let's see if I can tag other people. Hi, uh, uh, yeah, and if you're watching, um, feel free to share the video so other people can, you know, other people that might be interested can get to watch um, you know, how the translation is done. So uh, um, like and, and, and make sure that you share Facebook and like do well. All right, I just had to make sure I tagged a couple of people. Um, and over there in East Africa, you know, they're seven hours ahead. So um, I really uh, appreciate if any if any of the people in Uganda and Kenya and uh, or Tanzania are able to tune in. But I had definitely uh, let them know that I would tag them. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. And I'll share the Stella that we we're going to. Um, go through and so you should be able to see it on the screen and this is a, a Stella has 15 uh, lines in it now it may be small on the screen right now I will uh, enlarge it and blow it up all right just want to show you the the full size of it uh, the whole uh, image of it and so what I've done is I've numbered the rows so that when we're working on the rows we'll be able to call off the row number and everyone will be able to follow along. All right, and uh, let's see if I'm able to turn my cursor on here. Okay, and I won't be able to turn the cursor on. Okay, which is okay. All right, I'll, I'll have to be able to point to things to make sure that everyone is uh, following along. 
Okay, so before we begin, uh, as I said, there's four steps to the Tep Hesip of translations. So those four steps, uh, maybe someone on the panel can uh, just quickly give a summary of all four of those steps in the order that they are uh, to be done. I'll do it. Um, step one, just you said summary. So step one is you want to find a direction in which to start. So you want to read looking into the sign, the glyphs. Um, and one way to do that is by uh, body parts, uh, the direction of the deities could be looking at or, uh, you know, birds or any other animal or reptiles that could be in, the, in that. And then uh, that's that's step one. It's always going to be the direction. And uh, step two, um, you want to, uh, this is methodical, so you want to identify the signs. And uh, you'll go through each sign and identify those designs. And then in step three, uh, it's pretty much more like grouping them. Uh, some people may be more far advanced in the grouping part where they could, they know exactly what glyphs form a word. So uh, that, that will be part of that and step four is to come up with a sensible translation from the grouping of those signs okay uh aka excellent all right and so um yeah and i did say summary but i forget this is not freestyle friday so we can kind of elaborate on on those steps uh a little bit uh but that was that was good because it's not really too much more to say about about those steps but there are those four steps are immutable everyone follows those four steps or should follow those four steps and once you st come step outside of those four steps then you you will be making mistakes all right even if we were to travel back in time or we were uh the ancient egyptians themselves or the remich themselves they follow these four steps it's just that it happens very quickly when you um know the language all right. And obviously, step four will be omitted because there's no need to translate uh, a single language. You can't translate a single language. Uh, translation involves two or more languages. So step four would be the one that is not um, would not be done if you're just dealing with your your particular language. All right. So let's just. Uh, you, mm -hmm. I, just <laughs> I when you're saying that, I quickly thought of. Oh. Is it like, uh, it's kind of like how, you know, some people just dance and, you know, and then sometimes you have to break down the dancing steps, like, you know, each step at a time, but most people just know like a dance move. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good uh, way of, of uh, looking at it. All right. So, all right. So let's um, jump into it. And then afterwards, we will, um, we will, we, I will post the link so that, people may be able to come in and uh, ask questions, but we'll try to monitor the chat as well. All right. So again, um, each team hotel to those who have just tuned in. So let's go ahead and jump into this. Um, I'm gonna have to switch over because I need to be able to show my cursor. So uh, you're going to see a change in the picture. Okay. So here we are the same picture. And so now that we've seen the whole Stella, now I'm going to zoom in so we can see, see it line by line. All right, so let me increase, enlarge, enlarge. Okay, so this should be uh, big enough for everyone to see. And uh, I just need confirmation uh, from anyone to make sure that we can actually see the glyphs. And if I need to blow it up bigger, uh, let me know. We're good. You can see. Okay. I'm checking YouTube. Yeah, it looks good on YouTube. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let us uh, st begin. So we're going to start with line one and we're going to start with step number one. So uh, actually, I should have asked for step one while I had the whole uh, picture up where you can see the whole thing. But this is good enough. So step one is what? So let's repeat step one. So someone wants to repeat what step one is? That would be to identify the direction in which the signs are to be read. 
Okay, so which direction should these signs be read and why? So um, this one is um, supposed to be read from right to left, um, horizontal. And um, it's um, read horizontally because um, they are written in rows. And I read right to left because we can um, see from the glyphs of the anime uh, the anime glyphs like um, the seated deity. We have um, the bird, I think, uh, two different birds, and they're all facing right. So we're going to be reading into the sign. So right to left, horizontal. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So ho hopefully everyone follows that. Uh, we always read into the signs. And the easiest way to remember that is the same thing that we do every day to each other. We always talk to each other. Uh, in each other's face. We don't talk to each other's back or the back of each other's heads. So pretend that you're having a conversation with the glyphs and you will always remember that rule. Okay. So, and that covers the whole Stella for this particular Stella. Now, if I were to, uh, matter of fact, let me show, let me go back here. If you look at the whole Stella, you can see that all of the glyphs are facing to the right. Now, the reason why I'm emphasizing that is because some artifacts, some pieces that you're going to sit and translate, this may not be the case. You may you may see a change in the direction. So, for example, you may see um, an artifact that has glyphs facing to the right in one portion, and then you may see glyphs facing to the left in another portion. And it may be a different statement or something spoken or or written about uh, that pertains to something else. OK, so for this particular Stella, all of them are facing to the right. So that makes our job easier for this one. OK, so I want to point that out. So now um, for the second step. So does someone want to repeat what the second step is? Uh, second step would be to identify the glyphs. OK, and that's simple enough. Identify the glyphs. And by identifying them, it means that you have to know um, what the glyph represents in terms of how the glyphs are uh, transliterated, whether they represent a single consonant, two consonants, three consonants, etc. All right. And you would need to know its potential role. And by potential role, every single glyph that you see is a pictograph. Meaning that all of the, the so-called hieroglyphs, what we know as Seshmet Nature, all of the glyphs are pictures of either the fauna, flora, or man-made objects that were um, familiar to the Nile Valley, um, cord in the Nile Valley corridor, okay? And that's why you don't see polar bear glyphs. That's why you don't see tiger glyphs and glyphs that, that reflected things that were um, not available or not known in the Nile Valley. All right, so all of these are pictures. Okay, so we call refer to them as pictographs, but they don't function as pictures. They have three different roles that they could po possibly uh, function as. And uh, the, the first role, or one of the roles is as a phonograph, which means that it represents a sound in the language. The other role is as a logograph, which means that a glyph can represent a word. And then a third role is a role that we uh, technically refer to as a semant team, but it's usually known as a determinative, where, where the glyph will help determine the meaning of the word. So you have to so when you go through step two, you have to be familiar with what the glyph is, how it's transliterated, and then the possible roles. All right. And you won't know the role itself by looking at the individual glyphs until you see how it is used in a word. And that's very important. So that's that will be step two. So let's go. Uh, and step two, just for step two, let's identify um, some of the glyphs. Let's just identify at least three glyphs from anywhere. So anybody on the panel, uh, tell me the row number. And then what glyph and I'll uh, follow with my cursor and we'll just show 
that. As a matter of fact, we, we you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so used to treating it like a Freestyle Friday, but I did say we're going to slow it down for, for our um, Divine Words Wednesday. So we're going to actually go and show how you actually look up the glyph. Okay, so um, anybody can choose one and let's, let's, um, um, reading from right to left, the first symbol, um, is this first group, uh, yeah, the first symbol is the M23, the sage plant. Okay, so stop and right there. Okay. So M20, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say a uh, real uh, important tool in this step, too, is the sign list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Looking at the mm -hmm. sign list, I see uh, I'm gathering um, all the information on it. I got M23, Gardner Cloak um, is transliterated as uh, lowercase s, lowercase w, lowercase t. It says sedge, sedge plant. Uh, phono, phono, it says uh, su, s, w. Okay. It's also yes. used as a logogram. Okay. Uh, for Nasut, Nasut Bitty. Okay. And it's the first part of a... Uh, Looks like what we call a, a formula. We see this uh, grouping of glyphs very often. This first four, we have the sedge plant, M23. The next one is going to be the X1, the raised bread loaf. Underneath that, we have the Hotep, the offering table, which is a uh, gardener code R4. And then we have the conical loaf. It's gardener code um, X8. Okay, so let's pause there for a second, because as you say it, so now that you've given those glyphs, uh, I want to share and show um, the actual sign list, an example of a sign list. So uh, start again with the very first glyph that you gave. All right. All right. M20, M24. Oh, wait, excuse me. M23. Okay, so now inside of our uh, textbook that we use, uh, A Beginner's Introduction to Meta Nature, in the appendix, we have a full sign list. Okay, we have a key sign list, and then we have the full uh, sign list as well. And this is also available in our book, uh, Has the Egyptian Hieroglyphic Writing System Been Deciphered? A Rebuttal to uh, Walter Williams. So you'll find this sign list in both books in the appendix. All right. And you can find it online. This sign list is available everywhere. Uh, pretty much. OK. Um, but now first, I'm going to look into uh, the key to the sign list. Now, what happens? Let me switch back. So. I do want to make a comment about. Uh, let's see if you can see my cursor. Yeah, there's a little bit of damage here in in this first part so it's, it's it's hard to pick up but because we're we're used to this offering formula and we we can see the other elements of it we pretty much know that this is a sedge plant but if you didn't know any information about it uh one thing you would know is that it's a plant and to say something about the sign list what a sign list is 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 a way it was actually put together by sir alan gardner in 1927 in his uh, grammar uh, book that he published uh, back in 1927, I believe. And um, and so what all he did was he grouped the, the different glyphs into categories based on the common theme that the glyph has. So all of the plant life or vegetation is in the category M as in Mary. And so we have different categories from A to Z for all of the different glyphs. So all of the um, glyphs that deal with men and uh, or man and occupations of man would be category A. Glyphs that deal with women and occupations of women would be category B as in boy. And human body parts would be in category D as in dog. Uh, vegetation, I said, is in M. All of the birds, all the glyphs that deal with birds would be in category G as in go. 
okay so by you recognizing that the first glyph is a plant then you know even if you don't know much about what it is and you want to figure it out you know it's a plant and you know to go to category m so i'm going to share the sign list and we're going to go and do just that so here's the sign list let me get my cursor back all right so here's the sign list so now this is the a sign list key so this is a an a an abbreviated version of the full sign list the purpose of this is so that you can quickly identify the sign itself or the glyph itself and get the gardener code now the gardener code is what i mentioned and what the brother uh sun june was saying when he said m22 or m23 the m is the category letter and then the number 23 is a sequential number that was given to these glyphs okay and it's important to know that the ancient remage the ancient egyptians they didn't have such a system they didn't have uh this sign list or this categorization scheme is not uh an egyptian one it's not historical it's only done for our purposes to actually identify glyphs and it's very very helpful all right so if i go down to m you see i scroll down to m and now we hit m and, and we had we're at the vegetation now remember the purpose of this abbreviated list is just to see the glyph and the code the gardener code and we're going to use the gardener code to go to the full sign list to find out all the information we need so now we're going to look for the plant that we are looking for and mind you this step is a what we consider a ob observation step what we would call a lookership step so you have to compare what you see all right so we're going to go down until we find the sedge plant and this is the sedge plant that uh sun june mentioned m23 and we see that the plant is here and the gardener code is m23 so now with that information that you find very quickly now you can go to the full sign list so i'm going to scroll down to the full sign list in the category of m so i'm going to scroll through pretty quickly and now we're going to go down now this is an example of the full sign list we're at the a's and i'm going to scroll down to the m's so we go down to the m and now we're at the m and we're looking for m23 so I keep scrolling down and here we are. We've reached M23. So hopefully you can see it on the screen uh, pretty good. And so we're at M23. So this first column is the gardener code. The second column is the glyph itself. The next column is a description of what the glyph is. An image of, remember I said, all of the glyphs are pictures of things, pictographs. And then the column four is the detailed information of what we need to know. So we have M23. The glyph is a sedge plant, and this is what uh, Sun Jun was reading. So we have a, it. It can it can possibly function as a logograph for the word suit, which means sedge itself. Phonetically, it could represent two consonants, the S and the W. Um, and that also as a logograph, it can represent the word nesut or nesutbiti, the word for king. OK, and that's so that's what you would have to know and understand. So that's the way that you would actually look up the glyphs. And you have to do this for every single glyph that you are working with, depending on the inscription that you're working with or um, the artifact. Now, it may seem like that's that would take a long time to look at every single glyph that you see on the screen. But it only seems that way at first. And, and if you do, if you're not already familiar with any glyphs, so look at it as an accumulative um, knowledge base, because as you deal with these glyphs, you're going to start remembering these glyphs. And also, uh, by the time you get to the point where you're attempting to translate something there, there's a lot of information that you should ha have already be proficient at okay, and, and um, familiar with. OK, so it's not like you're starting from complete scratch and, and ignorance uh, when you're actually sitting down and starting to translate. Okay, so no one is expected to just 
come out the blue and sit here and start translating. All right. Doesn't quite work that way. But you would have to identify every single glyph that you see in whatever inscription that you're working with. So we wanted to show that example. So uh, let's go through another one. So, June, if you could. Yeah, well, well, Jow, you would look up. Um, go ahead. And, if you could, would you go ahead and do the uh, the hotel, the R4, look in the temple front of it? Because that's a popular word. Everybody uses hotel. So if we can point that out and go ahead and identify that, let everybody know where it's at, what sign it is, and where they can find it at. Okay, so we have the Hotep symbol, which is the next symbol that you see uh, here, if you can see my cursor. And so we're going to look that up. Now, we, we already know it to be Hotep and everything that way. But if you didn't know what it is, so we're going to look it up and show how to accomplish that. So I'm going to switch back over to our sign list. And... Now, what um, what I do want to point out is that there are certain glyphs that you're going to recognize at first glance. And let me scroll up a little faster here. There's going to be certain glyphs that you're going to recognize uh, on first sight. Okay? Like, for example, and we explain this inside of the book. So if you had the textbook, you know, you, you, you're, you'll be in good hands because everything that we're talking about now is explained inside of the book. All right. But uh, there's certain glyphs that just, you're just going to recognize. Like if you see a glyph of an elephant, you're going to know it's an elephant. You see a, a glyph of a lion, it's a lion. You see a glyph of a bird, you're going to know it's a bird. You may not know uh, what type of bird, but you, you can recognize it, it to be a bird. But there are going to be glyphs where you're going to have no idea of what it is. And so the good thing about sign lists is that also a part of sign list is that um, earlier I said each glyph was put into a category based on a common theme so like I said a would be a uh, human male and male occupations B would be women and women occupations and so on but if you if you go at the end and it's a through Z but if you go at the end of the sign list after you uh, finish with Z You'll see a uh, an extra category of glyphs called tall and narrow. And so there, there are three categories that are created based on the shape of the glyphs. So glyphs that are tall and narrow, they're put into one category called tall and narrow. Then you have another category of glyphs called low and broad. These are all the glyphs that are low and they're wide or broad. Okay. And then a third uh, grouping is low and narrow or, or simply saying small. So all of the small glyphs, okay, not all, but uh, a lot of the uh, majority of the small glyphs are in a category. Okay, so this, this is for the purposes of identifying glyphs that you may, may have no idea what it's about. Okay, and I bring this up because the... Um, the Hotep, the Hotep glyph, you may not know that at first, you know, until you become familiar with it. So what we, what you will know, and let me go back to the Stella. What you can see here is that it is a low and broad glyph. You may not know what it is, but you know it's, it's low, it's not tall, and it's not skinny or small, it's wide. So, you know, it's low and broad. So you just have a good look at it and then you go back to your sign list and try to identify it. Try to locate it in the sign list. And so here we are at the sign list and you're going to look for that particular glyph. And as I said, this step involves observation or what we would nickname lookership. So you have to perform a, a bit of lookership. So you have to look for it. So we scan, you know, we scan, scan, scan. We don't see it. We don't see it. We scroll down. And by the time we get to this row here, we see it here. If you can see it highlighted on the screen, this is the glyph. And now we, we will recover the Gardner code, R4. So now we know the Gardner code for it. We still don't have an idea what it is, 
but now we have the code for it so that we can look for it in the full sign list so now we take that r4 and we scroll and we go down to the full sign list now we go down and i'm skipping pretty fast to get to the r's the category of r and so now we're at the category of r and it was r4 and we see at the bottom of this page r4 we see the glyph that we were looking at and now we have the description so what is it it's a loaf of bread on a mat okay that's what it is that's what it's a depiction of and so now we can look at its potential role it can function as a logo graph for the full word hotep which is the word for altar or it can operate as a phonograph for three consonants the h the t and the p and today we pronounce that conventionally we pronounce it hotep okay so now we know those those things so uh this is what uh son uh demo was referring to this is a very popular glyph a popular thing that people say and this is what it is it's a loaf it's an offering mat with a loaf of bread on top right and and to point out this this step is only the uh identifying right now because we will also go into more detail on about the loaf on the mat as we go into the uh as we get into the dictionary right yeah we'll be able to see uh the meanings of 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 full words if this is inside of a word or if it's a word in and of itself exactly so this is the information so we're still at the identification process which is step two all right and so again like i said let me switch back to the uh stella uh we would have to we have to do this for every single glyph now like i said that may seem very daunting and and meticulous something to do but as i said as you do this you're going to already know and memorize a lot of this um and it's going to accumulate over time so you got to put in the work put in the practice and it this will be a piece of cake okay uh at least at the very start when you when you try to translate your first inscription uh there are glyphs that you should have already memorized just just throughout the course of learning okay and we emphasize that in our study course okay and it's in emphasized in the book the monoliterals you should already commit those to memory there are only 20 uh four individual glyphs that represent the 25 consonantal sounds in the language those should be committed to memory when you first start learning okay anyone who teaches the language that's going to be the first thing that they uh one of the first things that they start you off with they, they're going to give you that kind of assignment for you to memorize the monoliterals uh, and likewise this is what we do in our study course uh by the time you reach chapter four in the book you should already uh have those memorized okay so you won't have to look those up obviously you will you will look up the others that you may not be familiar with okay so i think that's enough of step two uh to showcase step two so we went to step one and step two so now we're at step three so uh can someone on the panel um repeat what step three is and then we'll show uh that step Um, on step three, we'll be grouping the, you know, the glyphs into, into words. That's when we pass them together and then look, um, we search in the dictionary. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So step three is known as pattern recognition and parsing. So you're going to, uh, recognize patterns of glyphs that form words. And you're going to parse those words and parsing simply means to to separate to divide something up okay and so you're going to parse them and the reason why that's important is because unlike english and and our writing system that we use for english in sesh metal nature there are no spaces there's no punctuations between the glyphs so you're not going to see any commas you're not going to see any periods you're not going to see any spaces that that will indicate where one word ends and another one begins none of those things are exist in session so we have to do it ourselves 
And so step three is that step. So you're going to take the individual glyphs and your knowledge of them. And now you're going to recognize the groupings and group them together into the words that they uh, make up. And so that therefore we refer to it as a parsing step. Now, what helps us with that step, what allows us to know where one word ends and another one begins is what's called determinatives. That's one of the helping uh, helping hands that we have available. And so which means that you're going to have to take some time to become familiar with at least the popular determinatives, glyphs that are used as determinatives on a regular basis. So it's always good to try to commit some of those to memory. That way you can easily recognize um, the determinatives. And the reason why is because determinatives come at the end of words. And because they come at the end of words, it allows you to know where that word ends and therefore another one begins. And then you parse it right there. But now, not all words will have a determinative. So it's only a helping tool. It's not it's not a, uh, a one size fit all tool, but it actually helps us out. OK, now for the words that don't have determinatives, these are the words that you're going to become familiar with over time. And you're just going to recognize them, the pattern of glyphs and what glyphs make up that particular word. All right. So that's what we have available. And also one other thing that helps us is the knowledge that most Ronnie Kimmett words will be two or three consonants. Not all words, but most. The majority of the words are two or three consonants. So that's another helping tool. And so we, we use all the help we can get when we're, when we're going through this process. Okay, so now with that uh, said, let, um, let's go through here and uh, parse some of these words and then once you do that, you're able to take the words and look the meanings up in dictionaries if you don't already know the meaning. And so we're going to show that process as well. So let's begin at the top and parse uh, some of these words. Let me get my cursor back. OK, so uh, actually any word, any word that's in the screenshot right now, if you direct me to what whatever the word is, and then we'll we'll go through the process of looking that particular word up in the dictionary. All right, the helpful uh, tool in this step is a dictionary. We use the um, we using the Mark Vigas for this. To you, yes. Yeah, we're using the Mark Vigas um, dictionary. Um, this is a good dictionary. Um, it's online. It's free. Um, mm -hmm. okay. So. Uh, I, I thought that was a bread loaf on top of the uh, offering table. So I, I tried to I tried to look it up. I took up I took the four um, signs um, M23. I thought it was an X1, R4 and then X8. That's correct. It's just it's just that um, the damage here, you don't see it like we're mm -hmm. so used to looking at it. <laughs> we yeah. we see it when it's not even there. But uh, but the bread whatever's up here is damaged you can't see it but go ahead so there's two ways to look up the word um when using the mark uh, the, the vicus dictionary you can look it up through the transliteration or you can look it up through uh the the gardner codes and i think what's it called the um you will create a, a gardener string it'd be like a, a a combination of gardener codes in a row um and you can search it up like that so in this situation i probably would search the whole grouping um as with gardener codes and then on page uh 1202 page okay. 1202 you'll see the same set of glyphs okay so let me pause you for one second because you mentioned something about transliteration mm -hmm. so um as you said vigus allows you to uh, search by way of the transliteration of the word or the Gardner string, which is a which is a string of the Gardner codes side by side. And so um, in transliteration, what transliteration system is used for the Gardner dictionary? 
I'm sorry, not the Gardner Dictionary, right. the Vegas Dictionary. Right. Um, yeah, that's probably something. That's the uh, manual decodage. Okay. Manual decodage transliteration system. Yes. And the manual decodage transliteration system, for those who may not know, is a case sensitive transliteration system. And it was developed for um, for electronic or digital media in order to uh, avoid the need to use these diacritic marks that uh, you have to have special software or special keyboards to to um, represent or to type out. So uh, it's case sensitive. So you have upper and lower case that represents specific um, glyphs. And so the Vi excuse me, the Vigus Dictionary utilizes the manual decoder system. All right, so we're gonna show that and um, and let me switch over to this dictionary. So let me just highlight. So you're saying the first four glyphs, the sedge plant, the uh, bread loaf, the um, mat with loaf on top, and then the conical loaf all together represent. Now, this this is something where you're, you're gonna just become familiar with because mm -hmm. this is a formula. Now these, mm -hmm. these are, um, separate words that you can actually look up separately but because it's so uh prolific in the language and in and all the artifacts it it becomes a phrase in and of itself that's that you can actually look up as a in a dictionary as an entry so that's what mm -hmm. we're gonna um we're gonna do so let me switch over to the dictionary and, and as as a beginner when i first got into it that's probably how i would have uh came across it when i didn't um when I wasn't so familiar with the words and phrases, I would start with the first glyph, identify that, put that sign into the um, search bar, and then I would go to the next glyph, and I would just keep putting in glyphs until it would, if it would give me a word, you know, I, I would keep going. Oh. So I would put in the first one, M23, and then, you know, I just would have put in all of them, and then it would it will pop up okay if, if a word doesn't pop up try taking off the last glyph and then see if a word pops up like until you uh get more familiar with the words and phrases okay so now uh what we recommend when people are performing step three and you're using a dictionary what we recommend is that people look it up even if you're using the vigus there's two options you can look it up look up words by way of the transliteration or the gardener string it's recommended that you start with the transliteration and the reason why is because in a lot of the scribal um works some glyphs are o omitted within certain words and so the dictionaries will only list one variation of it and so if you search with a gardener string and you expect that glyph to be there or let's say a glyph is not there uh let's just say for example uh, let me go back to the Stella for a second, and I will show you an uh, example of what I mean. So these first four glyphs here, uh, a sedge plant, a bread loaf, the mat with a loaf on top, and then the conical loaf. But let's say the, the bread loaf above the mat is missing, and it's actually missing from here, from this one. And if it's missing, then you're going to write, as a gardener string, you're going to write M23, R4, and then uh, I believe it's X8 for the uh, conical loaf. And if you're going to look that up, you may come up with no search results because the dictionary will have X1 in between after the M23. And so if you start, that's why it's recommended to start with the transliteration first, because if you go with the transliteration, whether glyphs are omitted or not, it's going to be there in the transliteration. So that's just a, another uh, helpful hint and suggestion to people. Uh, and this is what we encourage and what we teach. Start with the transliteration first, and then you can always cross-reference by looking it up with the gardener string. Okay, that's always a double check and triple check. Or if you have a hard time with the transliteration, then you could go to plan B, which will be the gardener string. Okay. Yeah, um, apart from the omission of some glyphs, sometimes you also have like um, graphic transposition going on. So um, if you put um, a string of, um, you know, um, gardener codes, sometimes they don't come in that succession. 
So that's why um, the transliteration will always be good. All right. That's an excellent point. So hopefully everyone is hopefully everyone's writing down, taking notes, taking all these these jewels in. All right. You can always uh, come back to our videos and, and review. All right. So we're, we're trying to um, give people um, information on how to do this. OK, so now I have up the guard, the um, Vegas dictionary. So when we look up, we're going to uh, go with what Sun June said initially. So we're going to look it up by way of the Gardner um, string or you actually already gave the page number. So what page? All right. Let me get my cursor over on the Vegas. And make sure when you um, search, you have to separate the gardener signs with the space dash space. So it'll be M23 space dash space X1 space dash space R4 space dash space X8. Okay. Now, mind you, uh, let's say I want to say a few words about dictionaries. Uh, what we encourage people to do is get all of the dictionaries that you could possibly get and afford. You know, don't break the bank, but get all of the dictionaries, get all of the resources that you can. You know, we, we're not stingy in our um, resource department when it comes to Sesh Metronature. Get all of the resources that you can. OK, the good, the bad, the ugly. And so with dictionaries, the same thing. Get all the dictionaries that you can because there are, pro, there are pros and cons with various different resources. The Vigus Dictionary is very good because it's digital, meaning that you could search inside of a, um, Adobe Reader. Uh, it's digitized and um, and it's free. And it has um, a lot. Of, it has over 40,000, I believe, 40,000 entries of, of words, which is which is pretty large. It's larger than Faulkner's Dictionary, which is handwritten which is uh, um, something that you have to get used to, which is the author or uh, um, Faulkner himself, his handwriting. You have to get used to the way that penmanship is, uh, where this one is fully digital and searchable. Faulkner's Dictionary, you can't search. Uh, you know, even if you had the PDF version, unless you get text recognition, and that becomes very hard because, because the words are handwritten as well. And tech, text re recognition software has a, a terrible time recognizing people's handwriting if if it can at all all right so that's the advantage and disadvantage between those two so uh here we are um with the word or the words hotep d nasu so if we notice on page 1202 as sun june said we find our series of glyphs now it's written in a different direction because our Stella is written from right to left, but the dictionary is going to show all the glyphs from left to right. So we see the the uh, M23 here. We see the raised bread loaf. I'm oh, sorry. We see the uh, yeah raised bread loaf. We see the uh, Hotep glyph, which is a offering mat with a bread loaf on top, and then we see the conical loaf. All four of those glyphs are right here. And so when we look it up in a dictionary, we see uh, the phrase Hotep di Nasu. Then we see the meaning and offering the king gives. And then this is the gardener string that uh, June mentioned. M23 space dash space X1 space dash space R4 space dash space and then X8. So you could search by using this string or you could search by using the transliteration. OK, so that is what we were referring to. Now, look at this variation. Um, this variation is the same thing, but the glyphs are in a different arrangement. Now, notice that if I were to search for this at uh, based on the transliteration, I would find and which is what I did. That's why it's highlighted in yellow. Uh, you see Hotep di Nasu, Hotep di Nasu. But if I were to search just for just for this string, then I, I wouldn't pick this one up because this has a, this has a different gardener string. All right. We have the uh, the phonetic complements to the word Hotep here. We have the P and the T or T and the P there, etc. So you see X1 and X3. 
and so on. So we have to re remember to always be flexible and and kind of be be uh, you know wear your detective hat. Okay, so just wanted to point those things out. All right, so let us. Um, we we might have to add we might have to add something <laughs> about the translations. Okay. We we understand that you know um, very rarely we're going to get a one to one translation from going from one language to another um because you know we hear a lot of people you know it's just foolishness but they'll say that oh we're looking at a vigus dictionary so we're going off european uh translations or something okay. and that just drives me uh nuts because uh, we have so many people doing work with living african uh in other african languages yeah, that's an important point. And so let's let's make that point known right now. And we, we, we say this a lot, but let's we'll include it in this video <laughs> to make to drive the point home until the wheels fall off. Uh, all of the dictionaries. Number one, like I said before, we recommend people to get all of the dictionaries like me personally. I think I own all of the dictionaries. I think I have them all like anyone that's ever been published. I believe I have it. OK, which means I got the French. I got the German. Uh, Waterbach, which, by the way, is is the uh, largest dictionary uh, that's di that's out. Um, various different English ones, Faulkner, Vigus, uh, even Gardner has an extensive vocabulary list that could be called a dictionary. I have the uh, Dickerson Dictionary. I said Vigus already. Uh, E.A. Wallace Budge, Volume 1 and 2. All these different dictionaries. Uh, so get your resources and 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 use them. Now, here's the thing. If we're ever in doubt about a meaning of a word, we have a way to verify, confirm it or refute it. And that that method that we use to do that is called the historical comparative method, which is a, a linguistic tool that allows you to see uh, words that are related in other African languages. So if we doubted the word hotep to mean offering or anything of that nature, what we can do is we could find a related African word or word in a related African language and compare the meaning. And we refer to words that descend from a common ancestor as cognates. And so these are words that are genetically related or languages that are genetic, genetically related. And by genetically, sometimes people get confused because they think we're talking about biology. So what I like to refer to it as lingo, uh, excuse me, a lingo uh, genetic. So it's lingo genetically related because we use that same term as bio in biology that we do in linguistics. So lingo genetically related languages, you can find words that are um, from a common parent. And so we can always fact check the meanings of all of these words. It just so happens that we don't have to do that every single time because a lot of these words in the dictionaries are correct. But if we're ever in doubt or we have a discrepancy, we can always go through that process and fact check it. So when anybody says that, oh, you're using non-African sources, then they, they have to uh, really come up to the 21st century and to the current knowledge that we have now. And they have to understand that we don't rely on these dictionaries like we don't have to depend on Mark Vigas. We use the dictionaries and stuff out of convenience. All right. But if we wanted to put in the work and check every single word, if you wanted to go through this dictionary and go through all 80,000 words and go through a comparison, then, hey, be my guest and, and, and get it done. And produce a, a, a dictionary that where you've gone through all 80,000 words and have gone through the, the comparative method to, to check against related African languages and do your due diligence. Now, that is a very meticulous job to do, but it's available and we could do it. So we do that for any time we come across words that may be questionable or we have a discrepancy with. But as I said before, for the most part, these dictionaries have it right and on top of that what's not included in the mark vigas dictionary but it is included in other dictionaries 
is that they will give you a source where you can find this word used in an actual primary source. So now you can look up context. Okay, so like for example, the Stella that we're looking at, if this says Hotep di Nasu as a dictionary entry, uh, beside it, it may say, it may give you the, the actual primary source of the Stella that we're looking at. To, to actually see the word being used and see the context around it. So there's there's plenty of things that we can use to to make sure that we ensure uh, that we're accurate as possible. So anyone anyone saying that we're using non-African uh, uh, resources or what have you, uh, that is the lazy way of of really trying to avoid doing the work. OK, and, and no one that I know of that studies the language or teaches the language says things like that. But I have seen it, so I want to make sure that we clear the air. So that's a, um, I'm glad you raised that point, um, June, but wanted to make sure we address that. OK, so now we spent all this time on on the word Hotep uh, Dinasu. So we see it in the dictionary. And so let me go back to the Stella. And let's work on another word. Let's see uh, another word. The next group is, is another common um, combination we see. It's the uh, I, which is D4, the okay. throne, which is Q1, and then the seated, uh, seated deity, which is uh, Gardner code A40. Okay, let me just get my cursor back over there. All right, uh, can you repeat that? I'm going to follow you with my cursor as you say it. Okay, the first one is the I. Which okay. is Gardner code D four? Okay. Uh, un underneath that is the throne, Q one, and then we have the seated deity is A forty. Okay, so you gave the the Gardner codes for each three of those glyphs, and so in step two, you would have learned those Gardner codes, but you would also learn how these glyphs are transliterated. Okay, so we would understand the transliteration as well as the Gardner codes. And this is, like you said, this is a very popular um, a group of glyphs, these three glyphs. So did you did you uh, find it in dictionary? I'm gonna go straight to the page uh, number or- yeah, 63. Okay, page 63. So let me switch back over to the dictionary. And I will pull that up once I get my cursor there. All right, so as we see, uh, hopefully it's in the shot. So we see on page 63 of the Vigus Dictionary is are the three glyphs that we uh, that you, you just mentioned, D4, Q1, and A40. And notice that the transliteration is Wesir. And if you were to look it up by the transliteration, as I just did, which is highlighted in yellow, you'll see all of these different entries for Wesir. OK, so you will be able to see the variations of how this word is represented in the glyph. So you see a, a version of it without the seated deity. So you may see that you may see it instead of the seated deity, you may see the uh, Netcher standard, which is R8. Or another variation, you may see the I and then what's called the sedan throne. This is the high back throne, which is Q1. And then you have the sedan throne or seat which is q2 and you may see it this way as well okay so that's all of them spell all of them are represented of the word wasir which is what most people know as osiris or asar some people say it as asar some people say it as osiris or some people say usir and you know we have different ways that people will say it all right so um so that was another one and let me go back over here and go back to the stella what's the next word a gender oh nab okay so you want to um point out the next word let me get my cursor back 
The next one we have is a basket with no handle. Mm -hmm. Gardner Code V30. Okay. I think that's a word uh, by itself right there. Yeah. Underneath, underneath that, it looks like the, uh, we call it a Jed Pillar. Mm hmm. So that makes me uh, think that that uh, basket is by itself. Okay, it is. It is. It's by itself. So you want to let's look up the basket. Let's look up the basket by itself and see okay. what that is. It's, um, and Manu Dakota is uh, lowercase n, lowercase b. Okay, so let us go to. Let me switch over to the Vegas, and we are going to look that basket up by itself. 